Stefan, welcome. Hello there. Yes. Um, Hi, Hello. I would like uh, for you to go ahead and introduce yourself to the people who might not know you and uh, go ahead and give a little bit of an overview of the upcoming talk. Okay, so my name is Stefan Koch. I'm still in Germany, but I'm gonna move to England relatively soon. And the upcoming talk was supposed to be about approaching zero template overhead. I'm not sure how much this is still true, but I will I will put a little bit of light into why compile time may be slower than you expecting, and a little bit of what metrics you can look at to try and figure out what's going on and how we may be in the future be able to mitigate it. What set you on the path toward chasing template performance? It stood out as being really bad. Like I was starting out doing new CTP to improve compile times. And then Ethan contacted me with his Binderoo project and he wanted to let me have a look at how much faster it could be when New CTFE was there, and I had a look at it and had to tell him, well, new CTFE, when it's finished, will perhaps give you a 10% boost. So it's really not that much because all of your stuff seems to be slowed down by how many templates you instantiate. And from that point on, actually, um, I've been working on trying to get the template overhead down. From 2016 on, I have been on and off working on that project. I do have full-time jobs, so mm -hmm. it can't be that much time that I dedicate to that. Did you have a solid idea of, of what needed to be done before you jumped into the code or did, was there an exploration phase or? A... For templates? Yes, yes, for templates. I still don't have a solid idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, there is always exploration and when I jumped into the problem, I certainly didn't know why it was the way it was. How far away are you from finalizing your end goal? How far away is anyone from getting to the <laughs> end, right? It's performance optimization is something you can always do more of. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And I've also been running into roadblocks with forward reference issues with other dependency issues that do not occur. And when you regularly write code, these forward reference and dependency issues don't happen as much. But as soon as you're trying to expand what you can do with metaprogramming on a language level, you have much more complicated dependency graphs to consider. And that means right now I cannot move forward. I have to get better infrastructure into DMD first before I can even try and make an estimate about when it could be done. If there's anything you want to say while I'm distracted here, please go ahead. Uh, there are some things that didn't make it into the talk because I wanted to keep the talk simple. And I hope that it will reach most of you. And I would be very happy to get feedback about it. Since you're talking about yourself here in the slide, uh, what got you interested in compilers in the first place? Hard to say, I guess. Always seemed like a kind of magical area. Like you take something lifeless, you, you, you take a block of text and you turn it into something that makes something happen. So you are breathing life into the source code, so to speak. And that was very interesting to me and I wanted to know how it was done. We have a question here in the live stream. If new CTFE was infinitely fast executed in zero time, how much would typical compile times improve? So I would say the average for both using code base, perhaps by 10%, 10 to 15%, that's that's how much you would get with infinitely fast CTV, I would guess. It is really not that impactful right now. There are cases like when you're, if you're using standard regex, then it may well be that new CTV does give you a second or so speed up. 30 to 50 percent but as long as you're not doing that then it's not that much faster cdfe right now is really not the main bottleneck is that what led you into templates when you realized that ctfe wasn't the bright light you thought it was uh yes i <laughs> i was actually quite disappointed when i realized that because i sunk so much time into making 
UCDFE flexible and jittable and getting it on the path to get really, really fast. Right? UCDFE is supposed to be 20 times faster than the current CTV we have once it's really re ready with jitting and stuff. And I found out, well, this 20 times faster only applies on 10% on the compile time. So it actually isn't changing that much. What is an expansion factor? And I was going to ask you to expand on that because I think a lot of people aren't going to follow what that means. Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's a term that you would have heard because it's just a name that I gave to the ratio between the code a human types and the code the compiler actually has to deal with. For example, like we saw in RDMP, you have a thousand lines of source code and you have to, and the compiler sees a hundred times that. And there the expansion factor is a hundred. And one thing I wanted to get at here, because we had it in the Q&A uh, yesterday, the speeding up your build process by doing a make minus j and just doing separate compilation. Because D allows so much better programming that that's not as helpful as it would be in a language where um, you like have static order of declaration and you cannot introduce anything into the semantic parts. D most of the code is not visible and the expansion factor basically tells you how much of the code that you have is the tip of the iceberg and how much is under the water and in rdmd for example you have a hundred times okay, hello world froze. for example has an expansion factor of over 200 because it's very little code on the page, but a lot of code if you instantiate all the formatting templates. So you, you touch here on the uh, the operator from the dip that uh, recently went through community review, which you guys, or at least Manu, I think is going to revise heavily. Is the dip going to change significantly? Do you know? Ah, uh, the dip itself? I don't think so. I haven't had too much to do with it. I was more working on the implementation, like getting the first implementation off the ground mm -hmm. and giving Manu the like grounding in what has to happen in DMD. I didn't really work on the text or anything. So can you uh, talk about uh, some details on how the implementation works? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> the implementation right now is something we're not proud of. They essentially work like templates. They copy the uh, expression, they copy the tuple, they apply the operation that you're applying to the element of the tuple, and it then, then pastes that in. It's almost as if you have, as if you had written a string mix in that, that uh, goes over all the arguments of the tuple. The current static map in Phobos is almost like what dot 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 does. So it still copies a lot of code, which is because of forward referencing issues and such things. If you want to avoid that, you cannot force the resolution of certain AST nodes if you do not know the complete context. And in order to avoid that, we have to copy these nodes. What happens is in dot dot dot, the expansion happens in place, but all the elements still have to be copied, which is a bit suboptimal, but the current structure of the compiler forces us to do that. And it, it could be faster, but, that's, but that would need significant changes to how DMD resolves things. But you still, you still see this, though, as a win over what we have now. I think I show the performance benefits in the slides. You have yeah. a one point X win in certain extreme cases. In mm. other cases, it's uh, it's lower. And I see the the concise syntax that you can get with the mapping and the reducing of type sequences. I think that's a win, but it's only a win in straightforward cases. So I would 
still recommend going to something like type functions for for a greater width. And you briefly mentioned type functions at the end of the slide. You you don't go into any detail on it. If I am I at the end of the talk, if I remember correctly, uh, you you talk as a future direction uh, type functions and uh, what was the alias? Uh, the alias assign. Yes, alias assign. So. Um, what what can you can you give a, a quick uh, uh, layman's uh, introduction to type functions? Yeah, uh, well, type functions are actually quite easy. They're just functions which can accept types as their arguments, or they can return a type as a return parameter, and it can of course also return regular things. For example, you can have a type function that's called size of that returns. A u int and it and it uh, gets a type as a parameter and then you can say pragma message size of parenthesis open int parenthesis closed and it will tell you it's for and alias assignment what uh, what what does that do it just allows you inside a static for each to uh, reassign an alias uh, symbol and the point of that is so you can uh, replace uh, recursive instantiations of a template with an, um, an iterative approach. And the advantage of the iterator approach is it doesn't need to expand or instantiate more templates with all those associated issues. It can just, oh, I just assign a new value to this alias. Um, there's a pull outstanding pull request for it. It is there, it works. It has a bunch of restrictions on it, so you can't have uh, circular references and things like that. And I, I think it's, it's worth a try. Uh, nobody's really done any performance checks on it yet to see if that pans out, but I don't know why it wouldn't pan out because avoiding doing all that template instantiation stuff should be a big win for it. Um probably sometimes like you would think that i see dmd in a bad light but that's not at all the case it's a very nice compiler to work with certainly one of the best that i ever worked with from the code base perspective like even the parser is relatively well amenable to change so we, we have a question here from the live stream for the recursive static map how much of the overhead is in syntax copy and how much is in semantic analysis? Do we know? I don't, but I can certainly uh, provide the data after the talk. I wanted to provide a zip package with the the code that I use to measure this, and I can include it in that data set when I publish it. Uh, so right now we're looking at the uh, why is dot 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 faster than static map. You've got three reasons here. Probably the, the most important one is that it uh, causes less code to be generated. Uh, yes, all those intermediate nodes that you have, they fall away. And alias assign, I guess, would do the same thing, but I haven't benchmarked that because that wouldn't even work with the size of thing. It only works on types. You cannot do t size of and then run the alias assign on that. So in the current form, it's still uh, too restrictive to do the things you wanted to do. And you mentioned in the talk, I believe you're probably talking about it somewhere right now, I don't have the audio on, that you don't see much use. Was it here or was it in the forum thread, the forum discussion about the dip, where you don't see much use for uh, dot, dot, dot and reduce operations? I think it was in the talk. Mm -hmm. I didn't find anything where I could use it for. You could use it for uh, any satisfies or all satisfies, but that's about the things that I can think about. That I can think about, I would do. I don't see any more things you'd like to do. There may be more. It's very straightforward to have to reduce with a, just a single operator, and I think most of the time, what you want is you want to map your type sequence to some subset of it, like the size or the fields or what members it has, and then you want to do some more filtering, some more elaborate filtering, and that's hard to do with uh, just one single reduction operation, I think. So until we get these uh, features that help reduce um, 
<clears throat> the expansion factor. What, what, uh, or do you recommend people avoid anything in template meta programming to keep their uh, memory usage and compile times down? Well, that's a hard question because if you have to, like, if you want to interact with the type system and do like type computation stuff, you can't really avoid templates. There is some. Um, Okay, well, I, let, me, let, let me clarify a little bit. I, I, I know you can't avoid templates, but I mean, what about template metaprogramming? Would you, I mean, like uh, recursive templates, for example. I mean, is there any specific uh, idioms that you would say, don't do this, do this? I, I only have don't. I don't have any <laughs> alternative that you can clearly do in the language, yeah. which is why I'm working on a relatively major language change for, for, from the out side it's mm -hmm. relatively major that you suddenly have types as a tangible thing in your language the only thing i can say is try to avoid recursive templates mm -hmm. but if you're in a situation where you have to work on types and such you cannot really avoid them try to put the stuff you can put into string mixins into string mixins that's and i think i also say that in the talk the fastest way of doing metaprogramming right now is using the string mixins. That's interesting because I remember years ago, uh, string mixins were a really big drag on um, compile time performance. Um, so you're saying that they're like useful now? String mixins by themselves are super fast. You just mm -hmm. you take the string that comes out, you parse it, you lex it, you run it through the normal compiler stage. Mm -hmm. The compiler is optimized for exactly the way that a string mixing goes in. What it is not optimized for is concatenating a giant string at CTFE, but that's mm. a separate question. Try to use string mixins as minimize the usage of append equals while you are creating the string mixing. That is actually most of the advice that I can give to CTFE optimizations as well. Try to not use append equals pre-allocate your strings, like use static car arrays and write your stuff into that. And then just slice the zeros that you don't need off before you return the string. Try to avoid pending at CTFE because it's quite expensive. We have a question here from Simon about typical Phobos pipelines. He gives a, an example of a range pipeline here, like x.map that filter, that reduce, blah, blah, blah. How expensive are those if a program has many of them? Depends on how much you reuse the same types. Does he use the equals array syntax in his example? Because if you do that, then per template, you will generate a new function. So you will always get unique templates, even though you're doing the same things. And then it's quite expensive. If you are using actual functions, so you don't use lambdas or uh, function li literals, then it's not that bad. But it can be quite a drag if you're not aware of that. And for example, if that is combined with like a static for each, then you will generate like 50,000 function bodies that are all the same, but the compiler doesn't know that because the context they're instantiated in is not. And we would need something like compile time data flow analysis to be able to say that. And that is a really complicated problem to solve. So complicated that I've abandoned trying to solve it and jumped onto type functions instead. <laughs> Uh, next question, uh, is there any way to profile the compiler in a way that attributes to compiled constructs, uh, templates, functions, modules, not compiler lines? There is no built-in way. I mean, the one thing you have is the dash V templates that can attribute to how many times you instantiate a particular template and you can, of course, hack the source code of DMD yourself and put like stopwatches into the semantic processing to try and get a feel for where the time is spent. But I can tell you most of the time, it's, it's going to be some template and focus <coughs> that all your uh, compile time is being sucked into. Or a static for each, if you have them. Those are also not very, uh, very friendly. There is one more thing that I wanted to bring up. The problem with these compile time eaters 
is they do not show up on the surface. It's like you see a 700 line program and just compile it and it takes two seconds to compile and three gigabytes of memory and you wonder why. That is also the issue with profiling where your compile time overhead comes from because it's usually some template that instantiates another template that imports another module that the module has to get pulled in then all the templates that are declared outside the module get also evaluated and usually when you try to profile these things you see oh all my problems are with the standard format template and that's simply not true in reality it's because format pulls in the Unicode tables and the Unicode tables get regenerated by CTFE when they are pulled in the first time. And generally it is really quite hard to know which part of your source code actually caused something to happen or whether that second order effect that is caused by something else. Are type functions already in the compiler? They are not. I'm not sure when I will propose them for previews. There are some small changes to Phobos that have to be done for Phobos to work when type functions are there, even if you don't use type functions, because type functions introduce the type of a type. There is now an implicit conversion between two types. When before getting the type of a type was not possible, you would get an error. <coughs> But with type functions, you can write alias t equals type of int. And then you get the type type back because int is a type. Super type of int is type once type functions are enabled. And that um, needs some changes to Phobos and some working out. And then I still have to write a dip. I want to make it available as a preview feature, but right now it's not in a state where I am proud to release it because there are still cases where it fails and it shouldn't. And I really want type functions to be a plug and play feature. It's like, if you know how to write a function, you now know how to do incredibly complicated meta programming because that's all it is. You pass types to a regular function and you get a type or a string or whatever. Back. Uh, next question from the live stream. Will type functions make new CTFE more important? Yes, much more, much, much more important. If it's actually used, right? If you still use your Phobos templates, then new CTFE is going to stay as important as it was. But if you're using type functions and, and if Phobos starts adopting type functions, then it becomes much more important. I can easily see CTFE taking up 80 to 90% of the compile time once type functions are widely used. And then new CTFE will be much more important and will be able to provide a direct speed boost on top of your type functions. Okay, next question from the live stream. If you were building a compiler from the ground up, what's the most important part you would, I guess, put in to not hurt speed as you scale up? I would make it task-based. I would build it on top of fibers if it's D-like language, because once you have in the code the ability to produce more code, the relationship between the lines of code in your file and what the compiler has to do is no longer linear. It's super linear. And then it makes sense to be able to fork off more compilation tasks while you are going because it's generating code while you're already working on some of the code previously generated. And that allows for a lot of parallelism opportunities. One last question for you, Stefan. Does going task-based address any correctness issues? Lots. I've started a thread on the DLang forum because of the feedback that I got yesterday from Peter and he said that he didn't know of any correctness issues that are that would be solved by making the compiler task based. And there are some and they are they have been there since like two thousand and ten when the when the two first came out. I don't see any other way to fix them. One more thing. I think I forgot to thank the listeners for listening at the end of the talk. So I would like to do that here. If you listen to my talk, then I thank you for listening to it. <laughs> and if there's anything that I could make better or more clear, uh, please let me know in some way or form. Okay, and uh, thank thank you, Stefan, and, and I'm gonna give Walter.
the final word here uh, for the conference. But before I do, I want.